had stuff go on. <coughs> we mentioned the prayer. Things going on in the country that make us wonder what the world is like and what exactly is happening around us. But we thank God that all of us are here safe, that all of us are here, that none of us suffer tragedies in our circumstances and our situations. Because you hear the reports on the news and you see what's going on. And we know cops. We know brothers and sisters that we have out there and it could have eased, you know, there's no nothing to think that it couldn't have been one of us suffering loss on either end of the spectrum. We want our thoughts and prayers to go out with everybody who's struggling to try to make sense out of this that somebody somewhere can be a clarion call of reason and calm that'll help navigate what are very turbulent times. But we also pray a prayer of protection upon all of us that he keep us safe, that he keep our loved ones safe because there are people who were not so f as fortunate throughout the week. And we want to give thanks for that, uh, that he watched over us and that it was not us. And we want to pray, uh, pray with all of them and for a national healing that we are in desperate need of. Um, we're going to get going with what we've been talking about. We introduced the subject matter that we introduced last week. Um, Kiaris. There is next to you in the bin study guides for everybody that I forgot to mention and ask, but can you make sure that everybody that wants one has one? They're next to you. Kijana, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm looking at you, talking to you. That just means your family, because when your family, everybody's name is all the same, it's just you. That's right. Doesn't mean I don't know one from the other, it just means that I'm getting old. <laughs> 36. Good <laughs> I know some of y'all are laughing, but I, I'm 36, I look 52, and I feel somewhere between on any given day. But we are talking about the imagination and the role that imagination has in the life of a Christian and the importance of it. It's not something that gets a lot of conversation, it's not something that gets a lot of talk. But it is something that is absolutely critical if we are going to have an experiential relationship with G with Christ and an experiential relationship with God. One of the things that we talk about, and we'll go ahead and get into the introduction and just to cover ground for thank God for our brother who came with with Carlise. I don't know if you wanna if he wants to introduce himself or just sit back there and be comfortable and uh -huh. yeah, I'm Josh. Josh, nice to meet you, and Mike, and everyone can introduce themselves. You know, everybody take the time to say hi to and make them feel at home. Sure. I know who you are. You're fine. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you. One of the many reasons you hear people talk about being saved, you hear them talk about going to church and doing the things that Christians are supposed to do, but you ask people what their experiences are like, and you get a vast number of experiences. The Bible promises, makes promises that are very powerful and very poignant and very life-changing, but there's a lot of people that don't experience that kind of Christianity and they try to figure out why. And one of the reasons that many believers do not experience the kingdom in which they are supposed to be dwelling or experience abundant life is because so much time is spent trying to figure out or deduce what it means. In other words, we look at the promises of God and we wonder, were these promises made to us? Were they made to Israel? What did God mean when he said it? What was the context of it? And there is a place for that, but we spend time trying to figure out, are Christians supposed to be prosperous or are we supposed to be broke? Are Christians supposed to be healthy? Are we supposed to, what exactly does the Bible say about it? And we spend time trying to figure out through our intellect what it means to be a Christian and what a Christian lifestyle is supposed to be and what a Christian experience is supposed to be. It may seem odd to present trying to figure something out as a problem to our philosophical Greek-influenced world. In other words, for me to say that the problem, one of the problems with us experiencing abundant life is that we spend too much time trying to figure out what abundant life is. Well, for us, in our culture, you're supposed to figure stuff out. You have to figure it out. You have to know what it is before you can walk in it and experience it. That's the way we're built. To experience something without understanding it frightens most people in this culture. And many of us find it necessary to reduce our experiences to rationalize propositional rhetoric before we can accept it. I can't accept experience. I can't embrace what's happening in the moment if I don't understand it, if it's outside of my norms, if it's outside of what I've been taught how to process and how to, and how to experience. That leads to a problem. It's, there's a conundrum. The kingdom, exi the kingdom exists in God. 
the kingdom of God is a kingdom of God, exists in God, is from God and is of God, and God is beyond our experiences. God is beyond our intellect. He's beyond our ability to reason out and figure out and understand. So if the kingdom's in God, and God is beyond human comprehension, and most human experience is confined to what it can comprehend, how can we as believers experience that which is beyond our comprehension? The, the kingdom, what God has intended, when it talks about eyes have not heard, and eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither is it in the hearts of men, all the things that God has prepared for them, but he has revealed to us through his spirit. There, there was a point in time where what God had planned for everybody was completely outside of the bounds of reason and intellect and experience that anybody had. So if we as a people can only experience or only open to that which we understand, how can we experience that which is past our understanding? It's a problem, it's a conundrum. And so we're talking about imagination, expanding beyond what we understand and allowing God to speak, in, speak things into us that challenge our reality. He speaks those things into our imagination. Experiencing the kingdom begins at the edges of revelation infused imagination which evokes transformative desire. We talked about this last weekend. Experiencing the kingdom starts at the edges of revelation infused imagination. The kingdom of God is at the edges of our imagination as God reveals things to us. Sometimes they're hard to understand, sometimes they're hard to process, sometimes they're hard to accept, but that is where the beginning of the experience happens as God reveals things at the edges of our imagination that strain and challenge what we accept as possible and what we accept as real and cause us to transform as we begin to desire that. Our realities are too often confined to this world because our imaginations are constricted and our desires are pre-programmed. That's one of the things that we're going to get real heavy into within the next month, within next week and next month, is understanding that our realities are confined because our imaginations tend to be constricted and our desires are pre-programmed. And we don't even necessarily, we're not aware of the different places that pre-program and constrict our imagination. You know, the world that we experience and the families and the relationships and the marketing and the advertising and the rituals and the liturgies that we're engaged in on a secular level create boundaries that make it difficult for us to imagine anything beyond what we're experiencing today. Some people have great personal aspirations but are entirely unaware of what the source is and how they affect the person on a daily basis. Other people have passionate desires for their loved ones but when asked what they want out of life they are dumbfounded. I think the biggest response I got just listening to people talk, just reading the crowd was when we asked the question, or when I asked you last week, to take a moment and consider what do you want out of life? If someone were to come to you and ask you what you want out of your life at this point in time, what do you want for your future at this point in time, a lot of people would have a very hard time trying to figure it out. They'd have a hard time trying to articulate it. Some of us can tell us what we want for our loved ones, but what do I want for my life? A lot of us have a hard time trying to understand that, and there's a significance to that because our desires drive who we are as a being. A lot of us think that we are because we think, and we are because we desire, because we love, and we chase passions, we chase the things that we love, and if we don't know what we love, we don't know what we desire. Honestly, we don't have much of a clue of who we are, but that's coming up further along the road. Did anybody, I'm just sort of curious, did anybody over the course of the week take the time and ask yourself what you actually want out of life? What do you desire for your life? It's a tough question to think about, but as we talk about imagination and we talk about imagining things, the practical application of where this is going to begin is to try to get us to think more about what we desire and what we would like to see our lives look like. Wherever we are, at whatever stage we're at, if we could take a pen and write a new story or write the next chapter, what do we want the next chapter to look like? What do we imagine and envision that? And is there room in a relationship with God for our imagination to fit in that dynamic? Or is it just, oh, I just want to do what the Lord wants me to do? I guess we'll get there later, but that's a cop-out answer. It's what we're programmed to say, but it's a cop-out answer because we don't know that we actually get to, that God is at the same time sitting back looking at us, asking us, well, what do you want to do? 
It's like the girl asking a woman, I'm sorry ladies, but asking a woman, where does she want to go to eat? <laughs> I don't know. Where do you want to go to eat? Well, let's go to Olive Garden. I don't want to go there. All right, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? And so nobody eats for like two hours, and then I'm just so hungry that somebody will eat whatever. That, that's what happens when it comes to what do you want out of life? God, what do you want me to do? What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? That's how things play out sometimes. The series is intended to equip believers to overcome the limitations of human comprehension through a simple childlike tool, namely imagination. The discussion we introduced last week, or we introduced the discussion last week by talking about the difference between cognitive acknowledgement and affective imagination, or affective imagination. Cognitive acknowledgement versus affective imagination. There are some people who say that I can imagine something because I can intellectually acknowledge that the idea is within the realms of possibility. Yes, it is possible that, we'll say, we'll kick back to 1990, yes, it is possible that one day we will have an African-American president, but actually believing that is going to happen, and uh, that ain't going to happen in my lifetime. The, the, the intellect acknowledges the possibility. The emotions distance themselves from being invested in the reality. <laughs> Cognitive acknowledgement versus affective imagination. And affective imagination, that which we see as possible begins, we emotionally invest ourselves in. Within rationalistic societies, it's not uncommon for people to mistake the safety of cold calculated intellectual affirmation of hypotheses for imagination. The intellectual ascent of a proposition is much different from emotionally invested experiential process of imagination. Whereas cognitive acknowledgement expands possibilities, imagination transforms realities. Cognitive acknowledgement acknowledges, yes, something could happen, but imagination transforms the, what I see is realistic and what could actually happen because and I believe that I can imagine it happening and there's an emotional engagement that drives desire and drives personhood. Imagination sets the boundaries of perceived reality and shapes desire. Desire sets the boundaries of personhood. It must be noted that in spite of the, its profound influence on personal constitution, imagination is noticeably absent from the dialogue of most spiritual communities and churches. Within the diaspora of ecclesiastical circles, the subject of imagination is not without its controversy. So I just got, you know, we just talked for five minutes about how important imagination is and we're going to be studying the role of it. And why isn't this talked about in churches all that much within an overall circle? When we're teaching about spiritual principles and faith and spiritual things, why, how come imagination hardly ever comes up? We have to deal with that because there is controversy. What we're talking about, there are some circles that are very, very uncomfortable with the idea of human imagination being a component of a relationship with God. And we're going to start this one before, by dealing with that up front. So you know what the issues are, what the arguments are, why, are based on scripture, I, they're wrong. So that way you, you understand, if you go try to talk to somebody out in a uh, evangelical church about imagination, they might want to excommunicate you because they don't do imagination. The, you know, it's something that is foreign to a lot of circles that are rationalistic, that are stuck within propositional and ritualistic relationships with God. So we need to equip you guys before we even get into the deep end of this to know there's controversy, what is the controversy, where is it, and we're going to try to untangle that. Any questions or comments about what we've talked about so far? I'm a little conflicted with the fact that if we believe God has our life plan, <coughs> what sense does it make to want or desire anything else? I love that question. Okay, first thing is, if we believe that God has life's plan, that is a question of biblical interpretation that's very, very deep. God has under a plan for our lives, but there are some people that are fatalistic and say, God has every single step and plan for my life already ordered up. In which case, like you said, what's the point in asking that? One of the things that we've talked about here is that I'm of the belief, and I believe that the Bible speaks to the idea that God looks to partner with an individual. And that while he knows what path is best suited for you, what you experience and what you do with that 
is something that he will work with you as you walk in this relationship with him to harness your passions and your desires into a way that suits his purpose in his grand scheme and at the same time fits your passions and your dreams. So when we don't see God as a micromanager of your life. God is a partner. And just as with adult children, if you were, the, the metaphors, and I think we, I, we talked about adoption. I touched on a, very, on a very high level. That adoption in the Bible is not the adoption of little children. Because in Bible days, you didn't adopt little children. You would have a son, a full-grown adult, that didn't have parentage and didn't have an inheritance. And you would adopt him into your family and bring him into the family business and say, now you're my son and you get your share of the inheritance the way the rest of the kids do. And here's what I want you to take me in charge of, run with. And as long as you didn't bring dishonor and shame to the family and you're executing that, the father did not sit and lord over your every decision as you worked with in partnership with him. So if we are fatalistic and believe that God has every step of our lives planned out, then the question, then no, at God, then it doesn't make any difference what we want. But that's not the portrait that God plants or presents of himself in scripture. He presents himself as a shepherd, not a ruler. Somebody who is a caretaker and leads you places, but at the same time gives you room to be, to experience your personhood in the process. So it's a very, very good question, and it's one that I might actually take an entire, I might actually try to craft a lesson to deal with that more in depth because I don't have the time to really deal with the, all the sides of it within one lesson, but that's the short answer to it. If you believe that, well then yeah. I don't believe, and I believe that, and I can justify on a biblical basis, that that's not the portrait that God portrays of himself, even though that is sometimes, especially if you're in a Calvinistic perspective of life or of religion, that that's who God is. How is that fatalistic? Hmm? How is that fatalistic? Fatalistic as, the, as if to say that what I want and what I desire is irrelevant in the course of my life. The only thing that matters is God's plan for my life. That means that everything in my life is a function of fate. If I'm walking in God and I have no say about what anything that happens. No, that misunderstood the word. Okay. Not fatalistic as a terminal. Fatalistic yeah, is a fate. <laughs> okay. okay. So I, I was thinking on, on Carly's question. Mm -hmm. um, I teach now. But when I was in school the first time, mm -hmm. teaching was not a part of my mind. It wasn't the direction that I thought I was going to go. I was supposed to go to law school, but then I just felt like the Lord didn't want me to go in that direction because at the time, all I kept hearing is that lawyers are liars. So I didn't want to be part of a occupation that people look at as liars. So got married, had Mike, had Brian. Then I decided, because I spent so much time in school with them, that my goal for myself, and, and I always wanted to be within the will of God. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's my desire to always be in the will of God. But my desire changed. I decided to be a teacher. And now I may move from teaching and maybe try to go into administration. And it's, I do believe God has my life plan. I do. But sometimes he pushes us. You know how sometimes we say we have to walk outside of our comfort zone? Right. Um, sometimes he pushes us outside of our comfort zone and he puts us in positions where he wants us to be, or maybe we can reach somebody that we wouldn't otherwise reach. But I do understand what you're saying. Because I used to be the same, I used to be the same way. Whatever God's will is for me, I'm happy. Well, I also want to say, um, well, we know that he has this, this everything planned out, like the last days and all that. So if you're not, I feel like if you're not in the will of what, he has that needs to happen, then you're, you get put out of the way, one way or another. Okay. Because it's got to happen, and it's already written. There are certain things that do have that do have to all that are already written that have to take place. 
Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you a question just to see where your mindset is. Do you think it literally needed to take 400 something years, or 42 generations before Christ came on the scene? Was that time frame, do you believe that was set in the will of God and it was never going to happen before that point in time? Most likely. Okay. Because, why? <laughs> what was the point of that? Because, because he part of all that time. What well, would be the point otherwise? I think the point of it is, if at a certain event in a certain period, place, and time, if you're not ready to receive this event, you'll misunderstand it. If somebody threw $10 million at me 10 years ago, it would have been a waste of $10 million. Right. $10 million today, I'm going to work it. It's going to be $20 million. That talent is going to be $40 million. Before you know it, I'm going to be like Donald Trump. Somebody gave me a small loan of, you know, if somebody gave you a loan of a million dollars right now, first off, you're going to house, car, boat, shoes, clothes. You wouldn't be ready for that miracle. So to say that God has things and plenty of time, yes, your life is preordained, but a gentleman doesn't just open the door for you. He's going to say, hey, come in at the same time. So I'm not setting things up for you just to say, hey, this is what you're going to do. This is the way my wife is going to dress. This is the way my girlfriend is going to dress. I want you to only wear red bottom shoes. Hey, look, I want you to be comfortable. Them red bottom shoes might hurt your feet. <laughs> right. But I think you should have shoes on. You know, everything just can't be predestined. There's so at the same time, it does answer a question. Yeah, God does have an order for your life, but it takes imagination for one, because if you don't have a vision, you don't have a dream, and then it takes faith to work that vision and dream. Yeah. And you can't imagine yourself in a car with... Uh, everything and all the fits and everything, then you can't have that vision and that dream for it. Okay. There's a phrase in the Bible that you'll see on Renown that says, in the fullness of time. Now there's some people that may yeah. think that in the fullness of time means that God set an alarm clock and when the alarm clock went off, that's when stuff started to happen. But I read it when you look at the narrative of scripture, what in the fullness of time usually means is that when the people were ready, when the conditions were set, and there are times where God wants to bless and God wants to do what he's waiting for us to get there. The other thing is that from mom's example, from my mother's example, and from my own life, and I think that many of us whose lives take unexpected turns, their thing, well, just leave, this is the last thing in the world I thought I would be doing with my life because I am an introvert, I don't like being up in front of people, and I don't like talking to people. Yeah. I'd rather be sitting, I mean, I love all of you, I like you, but. Uh, you know, aside from my wife would have my company, my mother, she gave birth to me, so she stuck with me. But I'd be sitting at home with the guitar and being happy. And that's, but God knows me better than I know myself. And so he knows how to nudge you in directions that are compatible with the deep things that you don't know about yourself. That expose things about you and help you to experience a fuller life. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily him saying, Okay, you're doing this today, you're doing that tomorrow, you're doing that the day after, and six months from now you're going to be here. Because one of the things that you find out when you read scripture is that mankind has a tremendous knack for messing stuff up. But God is still faithful and continues to work with us to get us to the point that he sees would be best suited for our personhood. So in that sense, yes, God sees something that we should be doing, that we could be doing, that would be fulfilling for us, that might be completely outside of what we would see in ourselves and will continue in his sovereignty to try to push us in that direction and nudge us in that direction. And in that sense, it is set, it is determined. He sees, you have these things in you, these are the things I want to bring out of you because this is what's going to make you happy. At the same time, on our end, he's asking, what do you want to do today? What, or not what do you want to do today, but what do you want to do in the short term? What are your desires, what are your dreams, what are your aspirations? And as you get to learn yourself better, those things change, but he takes partners with you on a journey. He doesn't drag you and force you into something that you don't want to go into. So. Can, can, can I say one thing real quick? Yes. I, I was looking at what you had on the wall and I was thinking about Esther. That's exactly what I was from. You probably can't see it. Now but, Esther, it, well you know it depends on what movie you watch. But anyway, <laughs> Esther listened to her uncle and I mean did the things that he told her to do because he saw down the road how things could be. And he tried to position her so that should things arise that maybe she could affect the future, in which case she did. And so, you know, 
when push came to shove, the word came to her because she really didn't want to do it mm -hmm. because she knew she was facing death. And so, you know, the word that came to her was that, you know, all the things that happened to you was for such a time as this. And so the time came and she had no idea. They didn't know what was going to happen. But God positioned her, put her where he wanted to be, and she got favor. And, well, you know the story. And she had, and, and for her, it was a big move. And she said, if I perish, let me perish. But she was going to see the king. It's an outstanding question. It's a very, very deep question. I hope that at the very least we gave different perspectives to think about. Honestly, that could be a series, let alone just a, one entire discussion. Fatalism versus choice, and how do the two balance each other out? And that, depending on which theological bench you come from, you may come up with a different answer, and there's no wrong answer to it necessarily. There's just it's one of those things where God can work with either perspective and try to get you to where he wants you to be. Outstanding question. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome question. Thank you. Now, talking about the source of the imaginative controversy. As is the case with many foundational fundamental concepts to the Christian experience, the source of the controversy regarding imagination stems from the Bible. Or it would be more accurate to say that the source of said confusion is, comes from the people reading the Bible. Scripture is replete with commentary on imagination of man, and at first glance, most of what it has to say is not good. Consider the first word of the use of the word imagination, which is Genesis 6 and 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Or its second mention. Genesis 8 and 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, even though the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more, smite any more every living thing as I have done. God was concerned enough with imagination, with the imagination of man, that it was one of the things that prompted him to act at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 and 6. This is where God scattered the languages of man because they were erecting a large tower, the Tower of Babel. He says, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And it doesn't get any better as the book goes on. Consequently, many church leaders throughout the ages have read the mass of negative commentary in scripture regarding human imagination and have concluded it is something to be feared. This conclusion is not without its merits for the capacity of human dreams has given birth to any number of grotesqueries. The recent bathroom wars that have plagued local legislatures is largely a preemptive protective measure against what might be born of imagination. And you all know what I'm talking about with the bathroom wars, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, it's hate, it's hate, it's hate. No, there are people that are afraid of what some folks might imagine and purpose in their mind. And they're trying to make legislation that's going to cause that to, that's going to protect against it. Because people's imaginations come up with some very twisted and ugly stuff. The church at large has correctly observed that throughout the pages of scripture and history, Bad things happen when human imagination runs wild. So this is where the church's position, or a lot of circles' position about imagination comes from. Not to mention the fear of idolatry, of imagining something that you're going to worship. As a safeguard against this, the culture and lexicon of most denominations, including the non-denominational denominations, eschews the term, or the use of the term imagination, and goes so far as to eschew the use of imagination altogether. In its place, they have pointed to the study of scripture, pursuit of the will of God, and or the tradition of the church, or their church, as the mechanism through which the kingdom is to be understood or envisioned. So instead of allowing you to imagine anything, they're going to say, read the scripture, ask God what his will is, and follow the tradition of the church, and we'll tell you what the kingdom should look like. That's the safeguard. Because if you leave it to people to try to figure out, who knows what they're going to come up with. 
while well-intentioned, this approach is both erroneous and runs into our opening conundrum. Conundrum, that is to say, if the scriptures as are, if both the scriptures as a means of God's self-revelation and God's will transcend human intellect or temporal experience, how can human intellect and temporal experience, of which constitute most of the church traditions, be a mechanism for experiencing the kingdom? The church says the safe thing is to just study the book, pray, and listen to what at the traditions of the church, and we'll give you a vision for what the kingdom's supposed to look like. And that's where you get it from. Well, then, how are we supposed to find God if God is beyond all of that? Questions or comments? One of the huge reasons for this controversy is how the word imagination is used in the English language. To imagine or imagination carries with it in the English sense the idea of creating something that does not exist and never will exist in our minds. That's what a lot of times we understand imagination to be just fantasy. We're going to make something up that could never possibly exist and that's just what we think and that's our imagination and so we get off in left field because there's some absolutely ridiculous things that we can imagine that will never exist or fantasize about. The better term is fantasy. They mistake fantasy for imagination. The Bible is opposed to that concept. In the Bible, to imagine is to deal with what can be, what will be, what should be, or what is real in spite of appearances or experience. So as opposed to something that it can never be and that does not exist. And we're just going to imagine that there's something called unicorns and unicorns, there's Pegasus and Pegasus is going to fly as, as opposed to just fantasy, imagination is a matter of perceiving or dealing with what can be, what will, what should be, or what is real in spite of how things look or what we've experienced. There is a reality that is beyond our experience. There is a reality beyond the way things that appear within our society with what I've seen out of my friends and what I've seen from my family and what I've experienced in life. There is a reality that's bigger than that. And imagination is about perceiving, understanding what those things are. It may not seem realistic because nobody I know has experienced it, getting out of the hood. It may not seem realistic because all my people are there and everybody I grew up with is either in jail or they're dead and so, or, or they're still stuck in the same place. Nobody gets out. And so imagining out is not realistic. That don't happen for people like me. And imagining the reality that exists beyond that that there is a reality beyond that, and perceiving that and being emotionally invested in it is what imagination is actually about in scripture, that there's a bigger reality than what my mother did and what my grandmother did and what my great-grandmother did and as far as they went. There's a bigger reality than what the people that I grew up with told me about and what the teacher said I was going to be and what the, uh, my friends who graduated or didn't graduate ended up being. There's a bigger reality. And can I perceive it? Can I emotionally invest in it? Can I pursue it? That's what imagination is. We submit the following arguments born of reason and experience to elucidate this controversy. So this is why I don't believe, and the scripture doesn't say that imagination is a bad thing. First of all, where does imagination come from? God has imagination. And that's one of the things that we're going to point out. It's something that we don't think about and something we don't talk about. But God has imagination. Let me see how I'm doing it on time. Remind me about a clock, please. You get a clock up on that wall. <laughs> God has imagination. Jeremiah 29 and 11. <clears throat> For I know the thoughts I think towards you, said the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. I put in your outlines a breakdown of the Hebrew of some key phrases in that. And I'm not going to try to pronounce them because I have not, one of these days I'm going to stop being lazy and actually take a Hebrew class so that way I can pronounce this stuff when I look it up. And so that way I don't actually have to look it up, I'll actually know the language. But the thoughts, it says, for I know the thoughts I think towards you. The thoughts, the word for that, the defi definition, are thoughts, plans, purpose, or inventions. It translates to imagination. So I know the imaginations that I think towards you. That word trans is alternately translated as imagination. I think towards you means to fabricate, to reckon, or to account. 
that translates into imagine, devise, or esteem. So I know the imaginations I have devised or imagined for you. I know the thoughts and the ideas that I have about you. Saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, and that's that same word, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected, this one I can't pronounce, tikvah, to give you an expected end or a cord of hope, expectation, or outcome. So this is the prophet Jeremiah sharing a prophecy given of the Lord where he says, I know the imaginations or the thoughts I have towards you. It's unusual to talk about the imagination of God. Yet the cultural language of the Hebrew prophets referenced God's intentions for the future in an imaginative sense. When you look at the language used by the prophets when he was talking about things that he purposed, things that he planned, the language that they used to describe it was the language of imagination. That I envision something in the future up the road for you. I imagine, I plan, I see something that I would like to have transpire for you in your life and I see something that I'm going to move to try to make happen up the road. And now, I don't want to get too wordy here, it's an anthropomorphization of God understanding him in a temporal sense rather than an eternal sense and so there's some theological trip, trips that you may end up falling over if you think too far into this but the language that they used and the way they related to God was in the language of imagination. The prophecy of Jeremiah demonstrates this clearly tendency very clearly. Some translations substitute the word plan for thoughts because there's philosophical issues with referencing the imagination of an immutable, all-knowing, all-powerful deity. Yet in this instance, the King James translation of thoughts is much more closely aligned to the cultural and theological center from which the prophecy originated. Accordingly, the conclusion can be drawn that the people of Scripture understood God to have within himself an envisioned imagined, anticipated tikva or hope for his people. Another example of this in light of this new understanding is Genesis 50 and 20. But as for you, the thoughts, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring to pass as is this day, to save much people alive. This is, you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph says to his brothers, the language, the words used are the same. That says you meant it for evil, you imagined it for evil, you purposed it for evil, you thought that it was going to bring about my demise, but God imagined it, God purposed it, God thought that it was going to be for my good. So remember that imagination is not imagining something or fantasizing about something that will not be, but it is perceiving a reality that is beyond what is momentarily experienced or what is understood. So the language that they use for human imagination is also the language that they use for the prophetic imagination and, and, and the purpose and plan of God. For the purposes of this discussion, let's suspend the American tendency to think further into the complication of God's perfect will, God's passive will, God's permissions of will. I mean, you could have a hugely large theological debate in Ramblon for hours and end up in the exact same place with nobody really having any concrete idea of which way we're going. But let's accept for their culture, the way that they related to God and what they transmitted in scripture is that God has imagination that he employs in, under, in discussing the future plans that he has for people. And getting back to the fatalism argument versus choice, there are things that God wanted to do for Israel, there are blessings that he wanted to pronounce for Israel that they still haven't gotten because they kept making mistakes. And we have to ask ourselves if God's purpose and plan is immutable, then why did it take so long for them to get there? Or why haven't they gotten there yet? And ultimately, he's going to get what he wants on a grand scale. But on a personal, individual level, whether or not we get to where he wants us to be or what he envisions and imagines us to be is every bit as much about our compliance with his will as it is about the fact that he imagines it or he purposes it for us. If I refuse to preach, if I refuse to teach, this stuff would not be here today. Now maybe I might get there 10 years up the road, maybe I might get there 50, 20 years up the road, maybe I might never get there and then we got to question what's going to happen to me after I pass off the scene. But we are here because God purposed it and because I chose it. And both are true at the same time. It's a tension and an intimity that exists. Man is made in God's image. We're talking about where does imagination come from? God is imaginative and man is made in God's image. In discussing the nature of the imagination, one must consider its origin. 
Upon completing his initial creative work, God declared creation to be very good. This very good creation included that which was made in man's own image, man and woman. That which was made in God's own image, excuse me, man and woman. This man and woman were created with the capacity that, to imagine that was passed down from those who created in his image. It's not like after the fall of man, Satan said within himself, now that Adam and Eve have fallen, I'm going to create an imagination with them so they'll be really messed up. We were created with imagination, with the capacity to imagine, and God said, with that creation, it is very good. Contrary to that, evil is the misuse of that which was originally created by God for good. Evil cannot create a gnat or rearrange a single atom, but like a parasite, it can take over that which was originally good. Part of the strategy of Satan is to nullify the power of the church by making its members uncomfortable with our own insides so we don't use the blessings of emotions and imagination the way God intended. As a consequence of this strategy, there exists a tendency within church circles to declare evil that which God created and said was perfectly fine or very good simply because it has been abused and misused by fallen creations. So there's a tendency in religious circles within church circles to say that because people have made such a mess of stuff, we're going to say certain things are bad, emotions, emotions are unreliable, they're not faithful, you can't be guided by your emotions, you can't be governed by your emotions, and so you got to keep your emotions in check rather than experience your emotions, learn how to process your emotions. You say emotions are bad because people make mistakes with emotions rather than realize God created us with emotions and that there is actually a God-given function and purpose for them that are very integral to spiritual health. Such pronouncement and subsequent moratoriums deprive men of the discipline of discipleship which teaches how to harness these God-given gifts into their originally intended function. And I think I'm gonna hit one more point and then we're gonna wrap and I'm gonna, we're gonna finish this same lesson up when we meet up next week. Talking about, this is arguments for imagination and why based on the Bible, imagination is a critical part of our religious and Christian experience. The scriptures inspire, instruct, and constrain imagination. Along with the numerous negative commentaries regarding man's misuse of imagination are passages that instruct man on the proper use of imagination. On a very basic level, some of them refer to artistic imagination of woodworkers or craftsmen, where it says, Moreover thou shalt, in Exodus, as an example, Moreover thou shalt make a tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. Where it says, where, with cherubims of cunning work, the word cunning is the word imagination, imaginative. I, like I said, I'm not going to try, try to pronounce the, the Hebrew word. But cunning work is, could also translate imaginative work. So he's telling the artist to use your imagination in creating this artistic work. The scriptures give direction on how to use imagination. More to, in a more substantial sense, one might consider the instructions throughout the New Testament. In the New Testament, and I'm going to try to move along with this, in the New Testament, the word, one of the words that are used for imagination, imagination is used three times, but one of the words used is dianoia. I can do Greek because we're closer to the Greek language. But dianoia, in Luke 1 and 51, he has showed strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, or the dianoia of their hearts. That's one of the three times that the word imagination is used there. Here the Greek word for imagination is dianoia, which is used in another powerful and familiar passage. In Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy dianoia, which is translated mind in that passage. All thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. The exact same word used for mind means imag is translated imagination. So it's, in other words, you could substitute and say, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy imagination. Jesus instructs that God is to be loved with heart, soul, and imagination, or more commonly translated mind, which was the seat of understanding, desires, and passions. 
This stands in stark opposition to the ideology that imagination ought not be an aspect of Christian living. Christ would not have so paraphrased the first and greatest commandment of the Decalogue if imagination had no place in a relationship with God. The Apostle Paul prays for the dianoia of the believers in Ephesians 1 and 18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with the light or with light so you can understand the confident hope he has given to those that he called to be that he has called his holy people which are rich in glorious in inheritance. And the author of Hebrews references the prophets who say that the covenant will be written in the dianoia, the imagination or the hearts of his people in Hebrews 8 or 10. There is much more instructive commentary regarding the use of imagination of the believers found in the New Testament using common cultural references. This means that the imagination is not inherently evil within human composition. Quite contrary, the biblical record points to the imagination as an integral tool to be harnessed by believers as a means of kingdom revelation, relationship, and experience. A partnership with God, experience with His Spirit, and relationship with Scripture set the boundaries of imagination and allow it to be aligned with God for His designed function. Thus was, one must conclude that although when left alone to man's advice, devices, the imagination is a source for terrible deviation, when partnered with God in discipleship, it is a source of kingdom revelation. It is unfortunate that because religious establishments solely focus on the access to evil, granted by the imagination that they deprive believers of its access to truth and glory. To summarize, the imagination is a source of man making some absolutely terrible, disastrous inventions or de deprivations. Man comes up with some absolute messes and we focus so much on the mess that, a man's, that man's imagination makes that we don't realize that the scripture tells us that we are to love the Lord with all of our imagination. That God reveals himself to us in and through our imagination. That it is a mechanism through which we can relate to God and experience the kingdom. Not understand it, but experience it. That even though the biblical record talks exhaustively about the wickedness of man's imagination and imagination constantly against God, that he created us with it, and it has a function with us because he created it with it and said it was very good. And so the question becomes, how do I love the Lord with my imagination? I've never heard of that before. I've never thought about that before. How do I love the Lord with my imagination? We'll get there. We'll talk about it. How do I experience a world in an imaginative sense? How do I find the safety to imagine things? One of the things we talked about last week was that it's easy to imagine something or believe something for somebody else when I don't have to worry about being disappointed if it doesn't work out the way I think it's going to work out. And disappointment can be part of the process of God shaping and molding us and directing us. Everything that we imagine does not necessarily play out for us the way that we envision it. But it is a relational tool that God can use to allow us to be transformed and to experience life in a much more full way and to experience the kingdom. So any questions or comments before we close out in prayer? Like I said, I think that we had a very good discussion. Didn't get through everything. We'll finish up what we didn't get through and talk about some more stuff next time, next time we meet. I want to remind everybody that on August 7th, Bishop Joey is going to do a, con Johnson is going to be doing a consecration service for us. We do not normally meet on fifth Sundays, but this month on July 31st, I want us to meet here again to have a discussion about what consecration is, what consecration means, and then that week will be engaged in a week of consecration and preparation for that service. So I think that's the only thing that I want to remind you 